Yes. Looking good? Uh, okay, chapter one. Chapter one, globalization. This is already lecture number four. And on lecture number four, we're up to six, globalization debate. The globalization. It's number three. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Globalization debate. So what's the globalization debate? Global, we call these globalists. Globalists are, first of all, globalists. Globalists are people who are proponents, proponents for globalism. They believe that globalism is good, that globalism creates jobs, it creates prosperity, it creates... Come on, girls. Yeah, we're waiting on that. Hello, the three blondes over there. <laughs> Come on, girls. Already trying to teach you. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting on the three of you. All right? So, globalists are proponents for globalism, and that they believe that page, page 26, page 26. Uh, and they believe that globalism creates Jobs, globalism creates prosperity, globalism creates economic growth, globalism creates opportunities, I mean business opportunities, career opportunities, job opportunities, okay? Globalism raises the standard of living. They all say that globalism is great okay and it's a great thing for all of us and then you have what's called anti-globalists and anti-globalists believe that globalization destroys jobs okay globalization benefits only major corporations. Uh, they believe that globalization impoverishes the middle class and globali globalization serves major corporations while at the same time it destroys the environment especially of developing countries. Okay, so they believe that you got a lot of job losses. And the question is very simple. Is it true that we have the, or that globalization creates job losses? The answer is yes, of course. Globalization means shifting trade patterns. It means shifting production patterns. Let's use one special word we like in economics. The word is called Dislocation. Dislocation is a economic resource. It could be capital. It could be labor, which is not used productively. And as a result of trade, it becomes relatively useless and relatively worthless and needs to be shifted to some other better use. So. Globalization causes and creates dislocations, but the dislocations are temporary. So, while it is true, and that here's the example, that the Polish plumber will take the job of the German plumber, that's very true, exports of German BMWs to China and Bulgaria will create other German jobs, German engineering jobs in manufacturing. So what this location does and what uh, 
anti-globalization does. It destroys certain jobs, but trade creates job opportunity for others. Now, what else anti-globalists claim, which is very important, is income disparity or income gap. Income gap is the difference between high income countries and low income countries. And income gap also refers the income between, uh, the gap between the upper middle class and the lower middle class. And with respect to countries, with respect to countries, countries, the answer is this. Globalization has increased, has increased the gap between rich countries and many poor countries, where rich countries have gotten a lot richer and many, here's the key word, many poor countries have gotten a little bit or a lot poorer, okay? And here's what you need to understand, and that's where the key is. It's not caused by globalization. It is not created by globalization, this gap. This gap is simply created by bad economic policies. You got countries like Somalia, in Nigeria, in Kenya, and I can come up with 20 other countries, uh, yeah, including even countries we were talking last time, and I'm reminded about uh, uh, Malaysia, countries like, like Indonesia, where economic policy is so terrible that whether you have globalization or you don't have globalization, these countries will grow poorer and poorer. Now, at the same time, globalization has created extraordinary prosperity for a lot of countries that were previously poor. Uh, you guys probably don't know, just 30, 40 years ago, Korea was a very, very poor country, okay? Taiwan was a very poor country, okay? Hong Kong and Singapore were very, very undeveloped. So. If a country has a good economic policy, globalization allows it to grow way faster and better, okay, and raise economic standards. If economic policy is relatively bad, it doesn't matter whether you have globalization or not, the economy is going bad. It doesn't matter whether you provide them help or not, they're still going to remain poor. Okay, so that's the income gap between countries. Now, what about income gap between, uh, how to call it, it's like a class, like the middle class, like the upper middle class and the lower middle class, or the gap between the middle class and the poor in a country like Germany, like France, like any other country. Has globalization opened the gap or closed the gap? And the answer is, yes, globalization has opened the gap. So the claim is absolutely correct. But let's explain the economics of what really happens. What really happens mm -hmm. is that the gap is opened both because the lower class the income goes down, and the income for lower classes goes down because the lower classes are relatively low skilled relatively low educated. And they get competition from Polish people, they get competition from Bulgarians, they get competition from Indonesians, Chinese, and Malaysians from the ultra-cheap, low-skilled labor. So, for the low-skilled jobs, it is absolutely true that incomes go down in developed countries like the UK, like Germany, okay, like France, like the United States. So for countries, developed countries, incomes of the lower classes would actually fall. That's very true due to globalization. And globalization will drive also salaries because people come in, 
and because people come in, they drive wages down. But globalization will drive salaries lower because demand, let's say, for, uh, for uh, German-made goods or French-made goods will be replaced by, or British-made goods will be replaced by, uh, so, sorry, the supply will be substituted with Chinese supply or Indonesian supply. So there will be no demand for these types of jobs. So the low-skilled jobs, you just don't need the laborers as many. And if you need them, you hire foreigners. The price is driven down. The reason is that the overall supply, the low-skilled labor, is going up and the wages are going down. Now, what about high-skilled? Can we say that for high-skilled labor, uh, uh, incomes and salaries in developed countries are going up? And the answer is yes. For example, auto makers in Germany, especially engineers, here's the key word, high-skilled engineers, salaries are going higher. Why? Germany is exporting too many of those in China, in all other countries around the world, especially in the Middle East and even Eastern Europe. In Russia, Russia is one of the biggest uh, uh, importers of BMWs and Mercedes. Okay, so rising, rapidly, uh, rapidly rising exports for BMWs means rising demand for engineers, much faster rise for engineers, which the German economy cannot produce. Demand grows by 10%. Engineering universities offer only 5% growth. The other 5% difference will be covered with higher wages and salaries for engineers. So globalization drives wages of highly skilled and highly educated workers, in other words, of the upper middle classes, it drives them higher. Well, what about the incomes of the rich? And the answer is, the income of the rich is based on business profits. They're owners of business, they're owners of capital. Globalization increases overall profits, so rich will for sure grow a lot richer from globalization. High-skilled labor will also benefit, and the low-skilled labor will be relatively hurt. What's the solution? Anti-globalists propose the solution of shut down the border so that we don't get the foreign competition, where that, of course, is the wrong solution to the wrong problem, where the correct solution is improve education, improve the skills of the labor force, okay? Because the problem, the cause is not globalization. The cause is they don't have good labor skills. They have a low paying jobs because they don't have good skills. So that's about the income gap. Okay, here is another which they claim, anti-globalists claim, so-called cultural imperialism where American corporations it's like impose on the rest of the world McDonald's people eat McDonald's get fat and sick they impose on the rest of the world dirty Hollywood movies right uh, where the rest of the world doesn't want them or doesn't need them. So, one of the major criticisms, oh, it only enhances and allows Western economies, uh, their culture, to dominate global culture. And the answer is, as a result, it is true. But the West cannot impose the culture, okay? So, I worked for three years in the Middle East. Yeah, Arabs still listen to their, it's called Arab disco. They just listen to their own Arab music. Uh, you just walk around everywhere here in Thailand, not in the tourist, outside the tourist area. These people don't listen Western music, okay? Outside the tourist area, all they listen is 
Thai music, okay? So there is some truth, but it's not because it is imposed, but because people willingly accept it. We in Bulgaria willingly accept it. We listen to American disco and music, pop music. We listen to British music. Yeah, we listen to a lot of Spanish music, okay? So cultural imperialism is true, but not because it's imposed with a military force, because people willingly accept it. In Japan, people don't accept it. They reject it. In Korea, people just flat out reject it. They don't like it, okay? In the Arab Muslim world, they don't like it. They just reject it. In India, Westernization is in, in culture, Western culture is just flat out rejected. In China, Western culture is pretty much rejected. They understand that it's inferior, that it is relatively immoral. Okay, cultural, uh, and the other one is cultural impoverishment, and that's actually true. Cultural impoverishment. where the culture becomes posh. If you want, if you want to appeal to more people, you gotta lower the quality of culture. You gotta lower the quality. So it's very true that it leads to overall, overall impoverishment. Now at the same time, globalization means, as I was teaching in Taiwan, a lot of Taiwanese students and people are very excited about Korean culture. They study Korean language, they watch Korean movies, they're interested in Korean art, they travel to Korea, and they like it. Many Taiwanese were actually interested in Japanese culture and Japanese language and Japanese studies and Japanese movies and Japanese arts. So it is true that for people with poor souls and poor culture, it will result in further impoverishment. But people with a rich artistic soul, it will actually increase their own. You're not impoverished by coming and studying here culturally. You get to see another culture. You get to feel it. You get to see a different side of the world. You're not impoverished because of globalization. In your case, you having come here for four months in another country, you get enriched by foreign culture. Due to globalization, I've been living and working in nine different countries. I believe that I've overall enriched myself culturally due to globalization. So, this is partly true, but also partly false, okay? You got to understand where it's true and where it's false because the claim as it is, is not correct, okay? Some parts are correct and some parts are not correct. Uh, job losses, we already said it is partly correct, partly incorrect. Job losses result in this location. And we observe it, and there are studies, and by economic theory and by common sense, we know that the job losses are yes, but temporary. Job losses are so it is absolutely true that globalization always drives in its early stages temporary job losses due to dislocation of labor until labor readjusts to better, more appropriate uses. Okay, when foreign goods come at home, it is not true that they simply displace our local workers. What is also true is that our goods will flow abroad and whatever we export more, we're going to create more jobs. So what people don't, what people easily see is that imports destroy jobs in the importing industry. But what people don't see is that exports create many more jobs in the export industry. Now, if you don't have an export industry, you got a big problem, right? And that's where the problem is with Greece. They don't good export industry. Yes, they export olives, but 
that's pretty much it, okay? Not much. So the problem is they don't have an export industry because they don't have a competitive economy. They don't have good, well, properly functioning economy. And that's where the problem is. Same thing with Spain. Same thing with Portugal, okay? So jobs losses are temporary when the economy is normally functioning and when the economy is healthy. And job losses turn out to be permanent when the economy is dysfunctional and when the economy is fundamentally sick. Is that clear? All right. Let's see what else we got. Downward pressure on wage rates. Let's write it out. I already explained it. Wages. Absolutely true. For low-skilled, wages go down. For highly skilled, they go up. Same applies even for China. In Chinese, highly skilled Chinese, their wages keep going up and up and up and up. In my home country, Bulgaria, highly skilled professionals, their wages due to globalizations and, uh, and joining the European unions have gone up, up and up. Uh, not much improvement for the low skilled people and for the low skilled jobs. So this is partly true and this is partly false. Let's see what else we got. Economic growth, prosperity. Prosperity. Again, I already covered it. When the economic policy is good and sound and proper, prosperity has gone up, up, and up. When the economic policy is bad, <laughs> prosperity is barely, barely moving. Okay? So people don't prosper much. The example would be for 20, 30 years of Indonesia. Okay, let's see what else we got. Jobs, destroying manufacturing jobs, yes. Uh, these job losses, which are temporary, uh, the term and the criticism, that's part of jobs here. It's called outsourcing. Outsourcing, is the second, is the process of moving jobs abroad because labor there is cheaper. So you move manufacturing to a foreign country because labor is cheaper. Same thing applies also not for just for manufacturing jobs but also for services, sorry, for manufacturing jobs but also servicing jobs. For example, uh, you're going to have a call center, pure service, you're going to have a call center in India or you're going to have a call center in the Philippines. You had a question? Okay, so outsourcing, is it true? Yes, absolutely, nobody denies it. But outsourcing simply means you move where the labor is cheaper, okay? But globalization will still create highly skilled jobs. Like, yeah, Germany is still producing a lot more BMWs and a lot more Mercedes and a lot more of all of those highly skilled things that they produce, including pharmaceuticals, okay? Globalization has increased tremendously demand for pharmaceuticals. Again, Swiss, German, British, American. All right, so this one is also uh, true. We said the dislocation, the skilled labor, the unskilled labor. Okay, we call the income gap. Income gap is also known, so you can write this as equal sign, is also known as the earnings gap. The earnings gap. Earnings gap. So sometimes we say income gap is between countries, and earnings gap is between upper classes and lower classes in a society. So both is true, this one partially, and this one is very true, okay? Job dislocation, uh, real, okay. Yes, here is one of the examples which we know is a result of globalization, which supports the, uh, the earnings gap theory, is that most advanced economies like the UK, the United States, including Germany, have businesses consistently complained of 
shortage of skilled labor shortage of skilled labor so they need more engineers you need more web developers you need more programmers you need more chemists okay so we got a lot of highly skilled pharmaceutical chemists who go and work in Germany or in Switzerland we got a lot of engineers who go so uh, overall globalization has resulted in a major shortage of skilled labor and a major surplus and of course wages going up and a major surplus of unskilled labor and wages going down okay and the last, well, maybe more, let me see. Uh, next criticism, which is absolutely true in the developed world, is that globalization increases environmental pollution. Absolutely true. Western economies, and especially Western multinational corporations, love to export any kind of manufacturing which is polluting the environment to the developing world. Why would they do that? Very simple, basic economics. In the United States, in Canada, in Western Europe, the pollution environmental requirements and regulations are extremely high. And the cost of complying with environmental regulations is so high and makes production so high mm -hmm. that it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to move it straight to Indonesia or move it straight to Malaysia or move it to some other African, poor African country and pollute their environment so that you don't have to <coughs> comply with this. Now what you will see in the documentaries is that yes, the company has it's the technology and it uses the highly effective environmental technology in Germany and it's not polluting the German environment but they don't use the technology at all in some African country and the country goes dirty and heavily polluted and that's very very common so this claim is absolutely true okay so environmental pollution okay now uh, is it always true the answer is the following we got a simple chart where pollution grows with wealth and as the country or the economy gets relatively rich pollution goes down in other words as people are extremely poor living on thirty dollars a month they don't care about pollution. They just want to get a little extra job, a little extra income. So as your income goes $100 a month, $200, $300, $400, $600 a month, suddenly as your average income goes to, I'm just picking a random number, that's not true, $1,000 a month, you get to worry about clean water, you get to worry about clean air, you get to worry about clean environment, you get to worry about clean agriculture, get to worry about clean food, about clean resorts. So people will begin to pressure the government to impose regulations. So as the economy moves into this developed stage, the government will naturally respond to overall pressures. And we've seen this, for example, in the UK. The UK, you got to understand, 100, 150 years ago, during the early stages where the UK was very, very poor, the UK was extremely dirty and polluted, okay? So early on, before industrialization, it was very clean. Industrialization made the country extremely dirty. And as the economy grew richer and richer, the British started to impose more and more environmental restrictions, clean up the mess. Same thing happened in the United States. The most prominent example will be LA. LA at one point in its early stages, it had its smogs. Smogs in California was getting too dirty to the point where California started imposing very strict and very rigid environmental restrictions, which resulted in overall significant improvement in the environment. So, yes, it is true for poor countries up to a certain point, but overall they strengthen. 
Right now, one of the biggest problems in the Chinese economy today is environmental pollution, especially in the big cities. I haven't been personally there, but everybody tells me it's dirty, real dirty, okay? And they show these pictures with the smog where you can't see far out. You can't see even 500 meters away because of the smog and the pollution. So China will do what the US, what Britain, what Germany did 100, 150 years ago. They will, as soon as they grow and stand on their feet, become relatively developed, they will strengthen environment. Okay, let's see what else we got. This one is done. Next one is national sovereignty. National anti-globalists claim that due to globalization, many small countries lose their sovereignty, their national sovereignty. And the answer is yes and no. Yes, for countries which are politically weak, for countries which are corrupt, for countries which have corrupt leaders, their national sovereignty is going down, okay? But for countries, I'm just picking like Hong Kong, yeah, they haven't lost much of sovereignty, even though they're a small country. Uh, Singapore, they have not lost their sovereignty, okay? Even though they're a tiny little country. So it is totally false to say that because a country is small and weak, it loses its sovereignty. Just because a country is small doesn't make it we, okay? Like Hong Kong and Singapore. And these countries don't lose. So yes, many countries lose their sovereignty because they have bad governance, because they have bad government, okay? Because their government leaders are corrupt and they sell their own sovereignty. They sell it for their own profit. They pocket billions out of multinational enterprise and corporations or these major globalization institutions and as a result they sell out the country. In other words they lose their national sovereignty because they sell out the countries for their personal benefit so that they can have tens of billions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts. Globalization national sovereignty okay and the world's poor Okay, let's do the last one I already covered is uh, the world's poor. <coughs> and the answer is, it is not globalization's fault. Nigeria's government is really, really, really bad. It doesn't matter whether you have globalization or not. Nigeria is going to be really poor. Ethiopia's government is really bad. And it doesn't matter whether you have globalization or not. Kenya's government is really bad. And it doesn't matter whether it's you have or not globally. Well, in this case, globalization helps a little bit. Here's another example of a bad government. Bangladesh. Bangladesh government is terribly, terribly, terribly corrupt. One of the most corrupt in the world. Doesn't matter whether you have globalization or not. They will remain poor as long as government is really bad. Another country is Nepal. Nepali government is very, yes, they don't have the natural resource and all those things, but the government is really bad. And of course, they got civil wars and other problems, civil issues and all the other things. So as long as the government is really bad, don't hope globalization is not going to do anything, OK? On the other hand, if the government is very good, like Number one, Korea, like Singapore, like Hong Kong. The examples will be, of course, the Asian tigers. In that particular case, certainly you will uh, have a major improvement. Globalization is going to be very, very, very good. Okay, international business. Okay, so managing. And section number seven is just uh, a, an introduction. It is only an introduction is when you manage a major multinational corporation, you need to worry. So managing in the global environment, 
When you manage in a foreign country, number one, you need to worry about the political system. Is it democracy? Is it totalitarianism? Next, you need to worry about the economic system. You need to understand. If you're going to be managing and running a business, let's say you're a German, you're running a BMW dealership in Thailand, you better know the political system in Thailand. You better know the economic system in Thailand. You better know and understand the legal system. All right, let's put in here one T, the legal system. You better know and understand Thai culture. Local culture. And you better know and understand local customs and practices. Local customs and uh, practices. And you better understand the overall, which is part of the political and economic system, the overall economic development. All right? So, you should understand these things. And political system is chapter 2. This one is chapter 2, which we'll cover in the next lecture after the break. This one is chapter 2. And this one is chapter 3, and this one is chapter 2. So, what the next chapter will do is, after the break, we will cover these. Camera, thank you.